Okay, hi guys, and welcome to hopefully a quick show today. Uh, a little unboxing, my final purchase of 2023 as we wrap up the year and I prepare for my annual state of the collection. I'll do a quick wristwatch check. The Actron here, the Space View, massively iconic, lovely little pop of color. Now, forgive me, I forget the strap. You know what? I'll mention it a little bit later on. I do believe it's from Holbins, but uh, I'll address that later in the video. Let's get right into it. So firstly, who is Gerard Perregaux and why them? Well, if you missed me covering this brand before, a quick recap. Whenever a list of the oldest watch brands still in operation is made, GP is always somewhere in the top 10, up there with the likes of VC, Patek, Blancpain, Galet and all the rest of them. As a luxury Swiss watch manufacturer with its origins dating back to 1791, Best known for the historic tourbillon with the three gold bridges, which its newer logo references, today they are part of the Sowind Swiss watch group, consisting of them and Ulysses Nardin. Like many super proprietary producing horologi capable brands, GP has followed AP's lead and organized their timepieces into several distinct collections. First, they're extremely high-end and exclusive cutting-edge stuff. Everything from complications like tourbillons, minute repeaters, etc. And most importantly, their own groundbreaking patented constant force escapement. 20 years in the making, it's truly um, the intention of coming with a new generation of escapements. When you look at Gerard Pego history, it's obvious that Gerard Pego contributed to uh, part of the biggest invention within the watchmaking industry. Then there's the more sporty and youthful Laureato collection, a Genta-styled Royal Oak equivalent with its aesthetic and roots dating back to 1975. I might add here that the one named Absolute Light with its translucent construction is certainly a favorite for me. But even if I did have DuckTales money, at 44 millimeters and only a 30 meters water resistance and it being sold out, thankfully saves me about a hundred thousand dollars. Then finally, you may have guessed it, there's their more current traditional and classically dressy collections. And this is where my watch comes into the picture. GP has now refined their dress watches into two permanent collections. Firstly, their Art Deco inspired rectangular pieces with the 1945 collection, then their 1966 family, which as its namesake suggests, is restrained mid-century quite minimalist and very conservative in style. What I like about GP is they are still pushing ahead with innovation, even in the most snooty of watch circles and among the most diehard connoisseurs, enthusiasts, collectors, and so on. It's still something of an underrated underdog, especially when it comes to the high end. And as I've said a few times now, I'm always a sucker for rooting for the less obvious underdog. Do a quick knife check using the Benchmade Griptilian, one of my favorite. EDC knives. So this has come from Japan and it did go through the eBay authentication program, which is fantastic. I've used, I don't know, probably half a dozen times now. The time has come, always a nice touch. Uh, so this is the manual. I'm just going to check this off screen. Let me just check that. I have to confess, I am rather nervous about this because uh, the communication between me and the seller wasn't the best. Uh, obviously, I don't speak Japanese and his English was translated. He did a really good job trying to communicate everything to me. And also the, his feedback wasn't as perfect as um, I typically like it, but this is such a rare piece and such a great price. I took the risk. I have no idea what to expect. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a little nervous anyway. Da, 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 da. Oh, ah, look at this. 
this. So it's already going. Rose gold, but the dial is yellow gold. It's not the original uh, buckle. That's why the price was a little lower. But I'm gonna swap this out. But I think the real surprise will be at the back. Let's have a look. No returns if removed, but of course we can just slip it off, I think. <laughs> there we go. Oh my God. Oh my God, look at that rotor. This is some amazing decoration. Look at that. Actually, let's zoom in. Let's have a real close look. There's all kinds of finishing going on there. The original crown. I think it has been polished, but not overly done. So we can still see all the hallmarks there. The, um, cause this is 18 karat. It's not too rose. I'm not a fan of rose, but because the dial is yellow gold, I'm willing to make an exception, but yeah, that is gorgeous. Let's, oh my God, the winding on this. Let's just zoom out. Well, we'll discuss it why I went for this. Um, I had no intentions of buying it. Uh, <laughs> famous last words. But I'd been watching it for months, so um, let's see how it goes. I just can't get over that rotor and the decoration. Anyway, let's uh, take it back to the war room and give it 24 hours. So why does this watch look so familiar? Well, my recent review of the new for 2023 Frederic Constant Premier actually triggered me to reconsider buying this GP. That's always been kind of at the back of my mind and amongst my never ending watch list on eBay. I adored the FC, but if I'm going to have Breguet style hands without the Breguet budget, like I said in that video, I want them thermally heated to a more visible royal blue, and not the darker, almost blackened blue of the FC. Now I totally get what they were referencing with that, and maybe it does seem a little ridiculous to get so fastidiously insistent over such small details, but that's just how us watch enthusiasts are. Due to the diminutive scale of these mechanical capolavori, the most minuscule details therefore has big repercussions in how we feel about them, how they wear, and thus more significance. So yes, it's totally fine to obsess about the minor devilish details. According to various watch forums, this reference 4794 was a limited edition made in 1992 to celebrate the 201st anniversary of GP. So there were only 201 of these pieces made and available in Japan exclusively for the most loyal collectors. And that is a very small amount indeed. So this very much explains the modest scale and rarity outside of the shores of Japan. The movement, from the little information I could find online, so forgive me if any of this is incorrect, is allegedly based on the ETA 2892. It's 28,800 vibrations an hour, similar architecture, and the 42 hour power reserve does corroborate this. While understandably less prestigious than the fully in-house GP calibers, it does, however, feature the patented proprietary made power reserve module added to the movement in an offset dial configuration to fully evoke the pocket watch classicism of the 18th and 19th century. This was an age before the miniaturization of the gear trains could allow a more harmonious and equidistantly placed symmetry to the dial layouts. The solid gold dial and rotor both have utterly beguiling guilloche decoration. Apparently to get a more efficient weight, the end section is a heavier platinum. So the strap it came on was absolute rubbish, but I mean, you know, what do you expect? It's some aftermarket cheapo. I mean, it says genuine leather, but uh, I'm <laughs> highly dubious. But anyway, so I, um, I put it on this uh, Hirsch rainbow strap. This actually I bought donkeys years ago and I haven't really put it on a watch yet. So it's brand new and, but, uh, and it is still available. And I just think this black lizard grain really works. I mean, I've always said gold, especially yellow or rose gold with black is there's something very aristocratically kind of regal and rich about it. So I think it really works. Um, it does have the quick release 
uh, spring bars, thankfully. And it's in a semi-gloss finish, which I think just, you know, adds a little bit of shine, but not too much. Also, it's got the softer lining on the inside. So this is Italian calfskin, and this is in the shorter sizes, which I really do love about Holbins. You can go to the website and you can click short, you know, if you want the smaller strap or the larger ones. I did consider getting or putting it rather on the collar red, but I think this just doesn't work as well. The ostrich, I'll save this for another watch. I've talked about that strap before, also from Holbins, incidentally. In the Bondian intro of my videos, you may have spotted my role model and grandfather, GHW's Charles Frodsham pocket watch, the family heirloom that started my own watch journey. This GP feels like a wrist adapted progression of that watch, as it expresses all the sensibilities of that age aesthetically and convincingly too, without being betrayed by the overly obvious modernity of it being a wristwatch. While this 4794 obviously takes design cues from the Breguet Classique, their retrograde seconds equivalent in a precious metal is priced anywhere between three to four times as much on the used market. The combination of this handset and the contrasting classicism of the concentric finishes to the gold dial is just so luxuriously done. The stepped case is like the base of a Corinthian column, which in combination with the black printed Roman numerals immediately evokes operatic imagery of Palladian villas where I grew up in Italy and the Christopher Wren designed icons that dominates the skyline of London also later on in my childhood. I mean, I look at this piece, I can almost hear the Tannhauser Overture playing. So behind me is one of the best examples of neoclassical architecture here in Philadelphia. There's a ton of it here, uh, especially in uh, Washington DC and it even coined its own phrase of Jeffersonian. So this is William Strickland's Capo Lavoro, one of the earliest, if not I think the second oldest bank in the United States, done as you can see in the Greek revivalist uh, style. So uh, magisterial and exudes authority and I just love it. The neoclassical idiom to the design language will forever denote refinement and class because of its association with a style that has outlasted so many by centuries, along with its revivalism and influence in art, architecture, culture and so much more. This is also from a time that transported mechanical horology throughout the world, with the marine chronometry of Harrison, Kendall, Thompson, Mudge and so many others. This GP, like my grandfather's Frodsham, are also more in line with the British puritanical interpretation of neoclassicism, compared to the more continental perversity and opulence, frivolity, and even sometimes verging on the psychotropic, but most often of a strictly clerical theme. This modesty and luxury is often erroneously accredited to diffidence or the frugality of the toffs at the top, but is actually rooted in connoisseurship, and not necessarily needing to impress others, but still having something refined in quality without the garish overcompensation, like that of Tony Montana's villa, complete with live tigers and a decor that has inspired every Komoda boss's home since the 80s. A Richard Mille, a blinged out AP, a Rolex tarted up to the nines, will never be as pure class as this humble, little, almost unknown Gerard Perigot. So there we have it. Uh, what do you guys think? Please do add in the comments your opinions. It's a placeholder until I get that final grail watch. There's elements of this in my final grail. That's all I'm gonna say. You could probably guess what it is just from that. And that will be next year. So I really have to tighten the belt. A few more sacrifices in my uh, stated collection that I'm also gonna make. Stay tuned for that video. Oh, and by the way, check out this video, a very special video, something a little bit different if you missed it. Does mean a lot to me. I'll catch you in the next one. Don't forget to like this video, especially if you wanna see more free and independent content like this. Onwards and upwards, thank you for watching. Ciao.